Welcome to the Cedar Fort Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I'm your host, Linda Cherry, and today I am joined by Sam Castor. We're going to be discussing this really rich section of Exodus 24 and 31 through 34. Welcome, Sam, and thanks for joining me today. I was sharing with Sam earlier that uh, I have a lot of emotion attached to this particular subject because really reading Exodus 33, 11 um, was a very profound experience for me that led me to my discovery of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was um, nine, just turned nine when I started reading the Bible. And of course, I started with the Old Testament and started in Genesis. And when I got to Exodus 33, 11, I read that Moses spoke to God face to face like a man speaks to his friend. I just couldn't even believe it because I was growing up in a, in a church and in an era that people were teaching that no one could ever see God's face. So I, I ran out. I totally remember this so clearly. I ran out to the kitchen with the scriptures open and, and showed my mom and said, mom, God talked to Moses and Moses saw God's face. And this is incredible. And there must be somebody today that's also talking to God. And my mother, who uh, was a devout Christian, said, oh, this is the one verse that's mistranslated in the Bible. And she showed me, even in the same chapter, Exodus 33, verse 20, that it said that no man could see God's face and live. And then she also showed me in 1 John 4, that same verse, that no man could see God's face and live. And, and I was just completely deflated. And even though I was nine, uh, there was something inside of me that I, I just... I just really believed that Moses saw God's face. And, and then it was just the clear sort of extrapolation from that, that somebody else must be seeing God's face too, because the whole sense in the scriptures that it tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I just, I was just earnestly seeking for that. I really, really wanted to know God in that way. So, um, I took my I took my scriptures and I started going to church by myself to the Methodist church, and I um, took those scriptures to the to that minister. And then later in the next six, the next years that followed, I would still take that scripture to the different pastors of the different churches I was investigating. It was always the scripture that I took my very first one that I wanted to talk to any minister about. I have to laugh now when I picture these like 10, 11, 12 year old kids coming to a minister asking about it. And, and they always said the same thing. But by the time, you know, by the time basically I was 16, I'd also discovered that Ezekiel had seen um, the face of God, that Isaiah had seen the face of God. And even in the book of Revelation from John, he sees into heaven and sees God on his throne. And for me, it was not even, Sam, that I was seeking for that experience myself, but I specifically wanted to know that there was a prophet on the earth that God was speaking to and that people could know what it is that God wanted for us. One of the heartbreaking things for me is that these ministers were always telling me that revelation had ended with the with the New Testament, and that there was no more revelation after the death of Christ's apostles. And so, did you ever run into anything like that? You know, I, uh, I did. And uh, first of all, I w what a marvelous story or experience you had with you, you wanting to seek that, to understand it, to uh, to decipher it. And I can, I can imagine you walking up as a 10 year old <laughs> or a 20 year old and saying, Hey, you know, the innocence of a child and saying, this is what it says. And you're right. There's so many corollaries. And, how, and even Christ himself says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. How could we see the son of God and not see God? It just doesn't, I mean, obviously we've learned that yeah, God definitely has such a profound impact on people. You have to be worthy to see him. You have to be transformed or transfigured to be, to be able to be in his presence like these prophets were. And when after Moses sees him, you know, there are times when he comes back down off the mountain and he's radiating so much light. They're like, hey, put a towel on your face. You're too bright. We don't want to be around you because he's been changed by it. But he still had those experiences. And I remember having those conversations with people in Romania um, with different uh, religions because we would have conversations with people and we'd read par parts of the Bible. And um, it, it was always interesting to me that someone would profess to know God or know his word, but insist that they couldn't see him. And that that to me was 
it's such a tragedy because there's Christ, like we talked about, I think in our last discussion, me and you, we talked about how knowing Christ is eternal life. Mm -hmm. How can you know someone if you can't see them? And this, this idea is so interesting to me right now with masks that we've all experienced this, this, uh, identity suffocating reality of wearing a mask where you can't really interact with people. And we look, we look like objects to each other in some respects, if we're not careful. And so revealing the, you know, removing the veil, removing the mask, showing who we really are. Um, I just, this topic is one of the coolest topics, I think. So yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to discuss it with you. Thanks. And I, so I do have to just share that, you know, I think I've shared before that uh, I was raised in a household that was pretty anti uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and specifically anti Joseph Smith. And so as I was looking around and going from one minister to another, it's so kind of ironic that the last place I ever would have thought during those days was to look to the prophet Joseph Smith. And I'll never forget when the um, when I first started talking with my missionaries and they were bearing testimony about the first vision. And I just had such a such a powerful witness that still overcomes me so many years later, as I just felt such joy in knowing that what I had just felt as a nine-year-old in my heart was true, and that the message to me of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the restoration of revelation of the new and everlasting covenant and of the ordinances of the temple, it is that proof that God does love all of his children and that what was offered to those in the past of being able to know him personally is offered to us today. And, you know, Brigham Young once said that he felt to sing hallelujah all the day long that he ever knew Joseph Smith. And I have to tell you that I feel that same way. It's just so amazing to me to be able to have this knowledge that we do and particularly the knowledge of what was happening here with the Israelites and how it applies to us, because, you know, um, the whole reason for the Israelites coming to Mount Sinai in the first place is that the Lord had promised Abraham and then later Joseph of Egypt that he would bring the Israelites back out of Egypt and back into the promised land. But on their way to the promised land, it's like they had this sacred holy appointment. And um, that holy appointment was to come to see and know who God was at Mount Sinai. And interestingly enough, it seems as if he invited them to have an experience according to their degree of readiness. In other words, he's told Moses, prepare the people because I'm going to come down on the third day and some will hear my voice and some will get to see me. And in fact, we know that 70 elders, in addition to Moses and Aaron, did go up to the top of the mount and did see the Lord. And something that really just moves me here, and I really would love to know what you think, is that how the Lord invites us to a fullness, invites us to everything, even when he knows that we're not fully ready. In other words, he gave the Israelites a chance to come into his presence and know him, know him for themselves. And most of them said, oh, this is too terrible. This is too frightening. The, the mountain looked like it was on fire because of the Shekinah, because of the glory of the Lord. Uh, the yeah. voice of the Lord sounded like trumpets to some, and it just sounded like this overwhelming sound. And they ended up telling Moses um, in Exodus 20, you go talk to him. If we hear the voice of the Lord, we're going to die. But even more important to me than their response is the Lord's invitation. What do you think about that? You know, that he invites us to have it all, and it's up to us to decide our sort of readiness. What do you think? It, it, it's, it, I love that you highlight that. It's so beautiful because he's, he's calling to us. I think that when Alma talks about the song of redeeming love, he, he really is, is, I like to think, feel like he's singing to us. He's saying, come back, yeah. come back and be with me. And the agency is so central and so pivotal to who we are. He won't violate it, but he'll call, he will call to us. He will sing to us. And, and that means that it's painful at some level for us to recognize that we're not where we want to be, that we, that we need to change our position. We need to change where we're looking. We need to look to him and live. 
and uh, and and seek him seek his face i mean if you count up the, the number of times it talks about the lord revealing his face or seeking his face or that he's hiding his face or that you know that, that it's it's I, last i counted it's over a hundred times in the old testament and the new testament where the lord is saying well, i want to show you who i really am yeah but you and have I to, yeah he, we have, but we have to be re- like we have to be willing to receive it because i i think linda if, if he does it if he shows a space there's another verse in the Doctrine and Covenants that says when he, when he does show his face, the earth will be really literally destroyed or pu- purified by fire. If we're not ready for it, it'll destroy us. It's almost like he's saying, I love you so much. I'm not going to, sh- I'm not going to destroy your, you and your current position. I'm going to give you as much time as possible to come back. But, there, but when he does show it, it, there's something beautiful about it. I, I'm so glad that you shared that because uh, a couple of things here for me is that, first of all, just as we talk about that, um, the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham was meant to show Abraham who Abraham was. In other words, the Lord knew what he was going to do. Well, I feel like these experiences where the Lord invites us, and when we discover we're not really fully ready for that, and and it's this sense of what do we need to change so that we can, so that the Israelites could not say, he held anything back from them. They had yeah. to recognize this is my own immaturity. Um, this is my own uh, inability or fear that's getting in the way. And so what are the steps that I need to take so that I could have this experience? And, um, you know, I think this is yeah. one of the things when I, when, I, um, when I first joined the church, one of the things in terms of this restoration we're talking about that helped me to understand what this was about Moses seeing God's face in Ezekiel, Isaiah, is the Melchizedek priesthood. And the sense is that the Melchizedek priesthood being tied to the new and everlasting covenant, that's yes. the coven- covenant Adam had, it's the covenant Abraham, Abraham had, it's the covenant that the Lord was offering his people. That Doctrine and Covenants 84 tells us Moses plainly taught the children of Israel that with the Melchizedek priesthood, they could see the face of God and live, and that they that's, would. That's what it is. And they would. Yes. And they would learn the mysteries of godliness. Now, again, as a as a convert to the church, that little sentence, mysteries of godliness, that phrase, um, stands out to me because when I was searching for churches, descriptions of God varied widely. Um, even to the fact of whether or not he had a body, uh, whether or not Jesus as a resurrected uh, God has a body was always contested. And um, this sense of the Melchizedek priesthood enabling one to understand the mysteries of godliness, I think that that understanding comes because they're being offered to see and know for themselves. What do you think? I I love that. I agree with you 100%. You know, there's, and there's, there's so much <clears throat> sprinkled throughout history that points to this idea of, I mean, that's the open the covenant in Doctrine and Covenants 84, where it talks about, we're trying to, we're trying to know him. And it, it talks about Moses trying to bring the Israelites up. Um, and, and seeing, there's something about seeing God's face, like in DNC 93, one, where it talks about if we follow him and forsake our sins and call upon his name and obey his voice, that we'll, we'll see him and know that he is. There's something about seeing faces that's, so so impactful to who we are like like we can understand each other in fact uh, and there's there's a uh, an individual i've mentioned a couple times his name is emmanuel Emanuel swedenborg from uh before joseph smith's time i think he was in the 1700s he wrote a bunch of books had an experience very similar to joseph smith actually points to joseph smith that a new church will be founded and he talks about how when we um this is fascinating because this is a guy in the 1700s he says I've learned by seeing and understanding God, because he talks about how he saw God, which is just fascinating to me that there's all these religions that say you can't do that. But he says, I've learned that when the faces we have now are genetically inherited, 1700s talking about genetics, right? Wow, wow. Genetically inherited. And when we die, we'll, um, our, in the spirit world, we start, our faces start to reflect the virtues or vices that we've lived. And the more virtuous you are, the more beautiful you are, the more vice prone you are, the more ugly you become. And C.S. Lewis was heavily influenced by a lot of this stuff. But if you think about the beauty of Christ's face, I mean, he's, the, he's someone who perfectly lived all of the virtues. 
And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. He's, he's the only begotten. He looks just like the father because he follows those rules. He follows those divine laws. So there's some, and there's something about seeing faces that's so powerful. Swedenborg actually says that's how angels truly communicate is by showing their faces to each other. And when, when you look at someone's face and you see the emotion, you see that you can see people's histories, what they've dealt with a lot of times in people's faces, it's, there's something so divine about this idea that C.S. Lewis actually wrote a book called Till We Have Faces that was inspired by a lot of this stuff. It's one of my favorite books that yeah. talks about the, the idea of really becoming who we're meant to become and inheriting that beauty and seeing God, knowing who he really is. I love that. Does that remind you what you just shared about Alma um, chapter five? Have you received his image yes. in your countenance? Yes. And how do we receive his image, which you just said, if he looks like the father, because basically he loves the father so much, he's made himself one with the father. So I'm guessing that's the same way we receive the image of Christ within ourselves, is that to become one with him and seek after him. DNC 88, absolutely one of my very favorite. DNC 88, and you mentioned 93 as well. Um, DNC 88 talks about this sense of all light coming from Christ. And when we talk about, you, you mentioned earlier about withstanding the glory of being in his presence. And in fact, for the Israelites, when the Lord invited them, remember the invitations to everyone, to everyone. Um, when he invited them, he said, though, make sure you don't break through and stare if you're not prepared. And the reason why is because it's not out of meanness. It's literally out of his glory. It's out of his light. His, his manifestation of light is more than we can comprehend. Joseph Smith compared it to the sun. And so in order to come into his presence, when he's talking about the degrees of glory and where we will find our, our home, it will be a perfectly natural sense of judgment. It's not going to be some big shock to us. It's about how much light, and again, this is DNC 93, as well as not, uh, DNC 88, how much light have we been taking in? How much light have we been becoming comfortable with on a daily basis so that we can bear to be in that amount of light? In other words, if we're living a telestial law, we have a telestial light and we're very comfortable in a telestial kingdom. But if we want to be in the presence of the father and the son, then we want to take in that greater light. And that literally, it's the light that was terrifying the Israelites. But what's beautiful is that the Lord has shown us there. He's shown us again in the restoration and the first vision. He's shown us also in the dedication of the Kirtland Temple where he appeared. That there is still that constant invitation. Come up, come, come see me. And in fact, feel the wounds in my, in my hands, my feet, and my side. So that you can really know me and that you can be where I'm at. And the role of the, of the priesthood, and I really want to talk about this as a woman, because I know there's a lot of um, sort of tension today uh, with uh, women in the church asking about having the priesthood. And I want to tell you, I love the scriptures, and I'm sure that comes across. I mean, I have so many favorite scriptures. Everybody always laughs at me when I say, well, I love Isaiah 6, and, you know, and so on. But the truth is, and I really mean this, if I could only have one book of scripture um, you know, with me in some terrible hard circumstance, that would be DNC 84 on the priesthood. Because I am so grateful for the restoration of the priesthood and the power of the priesthood. And the fact is, it's the priesthood and the reception of the priesthood that allows us to come into the presence of God. And this is very important to our understanding. Moses taught it to his people. It's important for us to understand why the Melchizedek priesthood was withdrawn in this event because the people said they weren't ready. I do want to say that as a woman, I'm very comfortable not ever being a bishop or a stake president. It's nothing I would aspire to. I see the priesthood as, as a service. It's, it's all about serving and blessing others. As a woman, and in fact, I'm a single woman, I have all the blessings of the priesthood in my life, specifically temple blessings, particularly, but I am not, there's nothing that I have lost because I'm a woman in the church. 
I feel the full manifestation of the blessings of the priesthood. And I'm so grateful for that. And so what are your thoughts on that? And then I want to talk about what then happened um, because the people weren't ready. We'll talk about the golden calf too, but specifically they then get the Aaronic priesthood, which is basically, if you can't handle my presence, let's have the ministering of angels. Let's have angels and prophets and being in their presence, prepare you to be in the presence of the Lord. Anyway, tell me your thoughts about that. The priesthood, women and the priesthood, blessings of the priesthood. Well, I, I love the topic and I love your enthusiasm for it um, because I, it's, I have so many thoughts. First of all, um, I tell people all the time, at seminary is to classes. I'm like, hey, it's faith that causes miracles. You don't, you don't need the priesthood to perform miracles. Priesthood is what facilitates salvation. It's what facilitate, facilitates ordinances so that you can draw closer to God and, and uh, you know, go to the temple and all those things. It's all tied to that, that progression, climbing Mount Zion like Moses is trying to help the people do. But the miracles can happen with, with just faith. All it takes is faith. And you don't even have to be a member of God's church. You just have to be a member of his kingdom, and, which is why there's all these examples of people who come to him when he's on the earth and they say, hey, heal my child or, um, you know, take care of this need I have. And he says, I like to the woman who said, hey, even the dogs get the crumbs. Her faith was so powerful. Or the woman that touched his, his hand, his robe. Right. It's faith in Jesus Christ that creates miracles. So the priesthood, I think it's sometimes un, inappropriately conflated with, with the glory of God and the power of God. I mean, it, it definitely is those things. And his glory and power is so amazing. It, it overflows all of it. Right. <laughs> it's just right. It's pervasive everywhere if you're willing to receive it. And so on this point of the Israelites being willing to receive, we really have to, I feel like we have to surrender the dust of this earth. Like we literally have to let go of Babylon so that we can accept the gold of heaven above. We, we have to make room in our hearts. Like how, you know, I've talked about this before, but Enoch, it talks about how when he finally saw Christ, his heart swelled wide in eternity. I love that idea because it's, he was literally stretching his capacity to receive what God had in store for him. And we, God won't force it on us. If we want to cling to the dust, to the, to the possessions, titles, popularity, influence, um, social media, whatever it is, it's all dust. It's all vanity compared to his eternal glory. Nothing lasts except for him. And he's calling us to that eternal nature. He's calling us to that divine, uh, that divine appointment if we're willing to receive it. But, but he's not going he's not going to force anybody to heaven. And so is, is the, it's, it's interesting, too, because I remember as a child, um, as a young man, listening to, um, I have an uncle who taught institute at um, Utah State, Bruce Rogar, taught world religions. And I remember him and my dad talking. They were always discussing the scriptures about how the Israelites were invited to prepare themselves and cleanse themselves to enter the presence of the Lord. And the Lord says, hey, you need to perform some of these sacrifices to clean yourself. One of them is don't sleep with your wife. Mm -hmm. purify yourself and, and and do some these types of fastings you're sacrificing i think it's that it's not that that there's something improper or unholy about being intimate with your wife it's more about this idea of letting go of the trappings of this earth letting go of things that may distract you from me because i want you to be open to receive what i want to give you and all those things are good it's just in the right order make me the priority right I think that exactly what you said takes us back to your very first that you mentioned, Doctrine and Covenants 93, mm -hmm. about having an eye single to the glory of God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so in terms of the wives or the washing the clothes or engaging in other activities, and I think we have that same opportunity in going to the temple today, is about focusing our vision singly on him, if only for that couple of hour period, you know, of the, of the temple that kind of re, uh, refocuses our, our lives and, and refines our goals. And, and, you know, it's interesting what you said about holding on to the dust of Babylon or the gold of Babylon, because if you remember the Israelites were instructed to borrow jewelry from the, from the uh, Egyptians. And if we read some of the commentary in there, it says it's not as bad as it sounds that a lot of the Egyptians looked at that as payment for their, for their slavery and that they gave freely. But in any case, 
uh, when Moses is up at the very top of the mountain after the 70 elders have met with the Savior, and by the way, they it says they ate and drank with him, so we can guess that that was probably a sacramental ordinance. I want to remind everybody that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ, yes. and in any case, Moses is invited to go up and meet with the Lord individually, and the Lord says, I will engrave on tablets of stone the law that I've given you. And uh, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Again, the glory of the Lord is all over the mountain. And the people down below say, we don't know what happened to this man, Moses. I mean, it's just so funny, the, the wording there. It's like, at this point, how could they not know what happened to him? <laughs> um, he's yeah. been there for 40 days and 40 nights. And they tell Aaron, make us a golden calf or make us a, make us a God. And they use that jewelry, by the way, later, thankfully, after melting down of the calf and all of that, all of that treasure will be used to actually build the tabernacle. When we talk about having an eye single, here's a perfect example of a story of hanging on to the gold of Babylon. And they say, you know, make us an, uh, make us a God. And it's interesting to me because Aaron doesn't appear to protest um, but he makes them the golden calf out of all that jewelry. Um, and um, up on the mountain, the Lord tells Moses, the people are corrupting themselves. Now, what I love here is the humanity that literally we see the humanity of the Lord, as well as the humanity of Moses, because the Lord literally is seeing what's happening and he's infuriated. And he is saying, they're corrupting themselves. Leave me alone. I'm, I'm going to get rid of all of them and start all over again. And Moses, who isn't seeing it at this time, pleads with the Lord that he'll have mercy on the people. And he says, remember, you know, you have the covenant with Abraham. That's why we're all here. But what's so interesting when Moses goes down the mountain and he actually sees it, when he sees it for himself, what does he do? He's angry. He's, yeah. fur he's just as furious as the Lord sounded. And he, and he smashes the tablets, right? And I, you know, I, I remember, I remember having a debate or, or hearing, hearing a discussion slash debate between family members about what was on those original yeah. tablets. Yeah. We know that the Ten Commandments are the lesser law, right? That, and along with everything else, now, they're still pow powerful and divine. But I, I believe the stuff that was on or the, the commandments that were on the original. This is my total personal speculation, but I believe it was as simple as love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Mm -hmm. That like if they were if they were willing to do that, everything else would have fallen in line. Yeah. The higher the higher holier way that President yeah. Nelson was also invited and here's a good um, question for all of us because I always think it's so important for application, Sam. You know, these are exciting stories, but we have to constantly ask ourselves, how is this applying to me? And we have a prophet today who has said, I want you to come up to the higher holier way. And in essence, specifically when we talk about what was home teaching and visiting teaching where you reported each month and so forth was somewhat like a law of Moses and now and now and now that, now that we don't have that you know I'm hearing reports really all across the church how are we doing in our higher and holier holier way of ministering well we might be able to relate to the Israelites because the truth is I don't think we're doing so great I don't think we are either. It's really hard because it's almost like it became this excuse to not go visit anymore. And, you know, we just, it's funny, you mentioned bishops and stake presidents. My stake just got reorganized last week. And I'm on the high council and we had, it was a really amazing experience to, be able to see that process and that revelatory process unfold. Time and time again, during this meeting with the 70s that came and visited us, they, who, re, who are, the representative of these 70 men that went up and visited the Lord, right? They have that authority and that right. connection with him. Um, they, they invited us time and time again to visit with people to, to ministering. It isn't just sending, I mean, it can be sending someone a text message, yeah. but it's <clears throat> connecting with people, having compassion on people. And when I, when I look at the true doctrine of the priesthood, it's, it's about that connection. It's about that compassion. It's really about charity in action which is what Christ is trying to get us to do. He's, all those laws, all those things, all, and even and just like you're saying, with us being very similar to the ancient Israelites and learning the higher law, the higher law is seeing each other and having compassion on each other and loving and serving each other. And it, it's more effective back 
bring it full circle. It's more effective when you see people's faces. <laughs> I, I, lo I love you're saying that. And that reminded me in terms of being a higher, holier way is that the invitation to the covenant in Exodus 19, five and six was the Lord said that, um, that if you will keep my commandments and keep my covenant, you'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, he was wanting to exalt them from what had been slaves. He wanted them to be kings and priests, but specifically kings and priests unto him, kings and priests unto God. And of course, the, the feminine aspect of that would be queens and priestesses unto God. Yes. Takes us back to that single, the I single, right? Is that if we see God, we see ourselves as his children and that lifts us. So when, when you were talking about, you know, letting go of the dust of Babylon to be something higher, we're talking about the higher and holier way. Not only does God want us to know him, he wants us to know ourselves. And the best way for our, our, us to know ourselves is to see ourselves in relationship to him. And unfortunately, the, the um, Israelites only knew Pharaoh as a king and the false priests of Pharaoh who manipulated and exercised power over others. So they didn't fully recognize what was being offered. I also do want to say, because there's always this um, commentary on being a peculiar people, that um, that word in Hebrew is chakala. I'm not saying it right, I'm sure, but it means basically like you're my one and only. So a lot of rabbis refer to this experience at Mount Sinai and that specific invitation, I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. You're going to be a peculiar people to me above all other people. A lot of rabbis have taught for millennia that that is a betrothal of the bridegroom to the bride, his people. Like this is the most loving language that we can even begin to comprehend. And the Lord is saying, I don't want to keep you as slaves or even servants. I want to lift you up to, to be my children and to be then joint heirs and equal to me. And so this, this whole exercise, again, was to show them not just himself, but to show them what their um, destiny was as his children. And so again, we still have that, we still have that invitation extended to us. And I wonder how often we kind of excuse ourselves from it, or we don't feel up to it or you know we're fearful and um so many of the trials that we experience in life could have a different perspective if we saw it from that that the lord wants to make us kings and queens priests and priestesses in his kingdom and to your point sam serving blessing having compassion on others showing forth the pure love of christ which is what he came to show us um, in his whole ministry and life. I love that. I love that. And, and this idea of the mysteries of godliness, I, I have come to believe through my experiences in studying, and I'm not good at it. I'm still working on it. <laughs> but I've come to understand that godliness isn't just you becoming like God or having the characteristics of God. It's because God changes everything. Yeah. Christ changes everything around him. He elevates everything. It's one of the reasons why he veils his face because he, you know, he's trying to protect us from him at some level. Godliness is this idea of helping other people become like God and us becoming more godly in the process. There's, there's that elevating, that collective elevating, communal elevating idea that Moses, I'm sure Moses wept over. I'm sure he just, he saw the potential and his heart broke that they, and, and of course it would make sense that he would be angry. Yeah. You know, but here's the thing is, is that afterwards, we're still not cast out. Yes. Um, because one of the most beautiful things, and this actually not included in our scripture block, but I had to say it anyway, because we have 24 and then 31. Well, um, chapter 25 talks about the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And specifically, if the people were not ready, and they proved to themselves, he gave them the opportunity to prove to themselves that they were not ready. Well, then the way that he could show them how to become ready to come into his presence and really know him was through the tabernacle that later became the temple. And the, and the Lord showed Moses in the mount everything to do with the tabernacle, everything from literally what the, what the stakes in the, in the um, ropes would be like in the ground to the veil in front of the um, Ark of the Testimony. Um, to the services that would take place, 
the sacred holy feast and festival days and when they were to take place. And all of that, including zones of holiness, was to sort of replicate this experience again, come up to the mountain, come and know me. So we have the outer courtyard representing the telestial world. We have the inner with the terrestrial. And then we have the Holy of Holies where it was acted out. Here is what you need to do in order to come back into the presence of God. And everything is underscored by the sacrifices and the blood that represent this, the atonement of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that even when Moses wrote down the covenant before the, before the tablets were broken and before the Lord wrote the first tablets, Moses had written down the law of the covenant in a book. And um, he offered sacrifices and he kept part of the blood of the sacrifices. And he read the covenant to the people. And this is important. They said, we are willing. All that the Lord has asked, we will do. And then um, Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the book of the covenant and he sprinkled it on the people. And what an impact that must have had. I'm um, symbolizing what we read so often in the scriptures about we have to have our robes washed in the blood of the blood of Christ, you know, that literally we have to have his blood on us. And King Benjamin with his wonderful people who were already great people, when King Benjamin explained the covenant and the atonement to them, or I should say renewed it because they certainly had it before, um, the people fall to the earth and they say, oh, have mercy on us and apply the atoning blood of the Messiah on us. And so this step of the blood, the blood on the people, the blood on the book, the blood later in the temple under the Aaronic priesthood, um, that because of the loss of the Melchizedek priesthood, we had proxy, proxy representatives in the temple where the priest in the temple, the direct sons of, of Aaron, direct descendants of Aaron, go through acting out that return. So the people are kind of one step removed, which is unfortunate. But everyone knew that the holiest day of all, the most important day of all, was the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the high priest, and only on that day, could he go into the Holy of Holies. But as Paul said, not without blood. In other words, he could only enter into the Holy of Holies because of certain ritual sacrifices that took place first for himself and his family, then for all of Israel, and taking the blood of those animals and putting it on the mercy seat, putting it on the veil, putting it on the menorah and all of the instruments inside of the tabernacle. So this constant underscoring teaching only through the blood of Jesus Christ, only through the blood of the Messiah, can we attain presence and that place in, in with our Father in heaven. Share, share your thoughts. Uh, that, that's beautiful imagery and it's it, all i'm thinking is just it, he's just inviting us to follow him and surrender to receive surrender to receive it's yeah. let go of the distraction accept the the eternal and it, <clears throat> there's so much power in this I, I think i love the idea that when we see him he shall be familiar to us i've often thought well you got to finish that verse because john says we'll see him we'll see him as he is because we, we, are, we, we, we are like, we are like him. him. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I love that too. And there's this idea of a familiarity of, uh, uh, of that he really is our, our older brother, that he really is who we follow down here. He really is the person we put our faith in to descend below so we could ascend higher. Um, like Abraham Gileadi, one of my, uh, an Isaiah scholar who's one of my friends, he, he says that, you know, this idea of ascent before, descent before ascent. And, but, but this idea of him being familiar, of us knowing him, of us feeling him. It's funny, when I teach a seminary class, I shouldn't say funny, it's the wrong word. It's, it's um, very revealing to me. When I teach a seminary class, the kids will be, sometimes the kids will be goofing off or we'll be having fun. Or yesterday, for example, we were talking about the power of the word. And I said, um, who here knows curse words? And all of them, <laughs> and who, and I said, well, who here knows bless words? And they were like, huh? And then we started talking, you know, we're a little funny with seminary kids sometimes to get them engaged. And as we progressed from funny to the sacred and the solemn, as soon as I mentioned, and, and this, this happens all the time, as soon as I mentioned Jesus Christ, a hush enters the room, a, a, a reverence. 
a sacredness. And it's not just because he's powerful. It's not just because he's the God of the universe. It's because we love him, because we feel how much he loves us, because when we see him, we'll recognize him and we'll remember how much happiness and how much joy and how much identity is connected, that all of it is connected to him. And that, that reunion is, that, that's what I hope for. I, I hope I can be ready when he shows his face because we know that when he comes again, he'll show his face to many and that there will be many, many second comings as he gathers um, those who are willing to hear. I hope I can be ready to see his face. I hope I can let go of whatever distraction, continue to let go of whatever distractions or ever, whatever, uh, you know, whatever is eclipsing my view of him. I, I want, I want to be ready to see his face when he appears. Beautiful. That reminds me. Thank you, Sam, so much for that. You're such an inspiration to me. That reminds me of something beautiful that um, President Gordon B. Hinckley said about being able to see his face. And and this is under what we might call that um, title. And when you said the power of words, um, I think a lot of times there are words that are different to us. And so we, we don't recognize or pay much attention to them and recognize the power they have. So the phrase entering into the Lord's rest is used in Doctrine and Covenants 84 when it does describe that this means coming into the presence of the Lord, entering into his rest means coming into his presence. And um, Gordon B. Hinckley said, it has been my privilege on various occasions to converse with presidents of the United States and important men in other governments. At the close of each such occasion, I've reflected on the rewarding experience of standing with confidence in the presence of an acknowledged leader. And then I have thought, what a wonderful thing. What a marvelous thing it would be to stand with confidence, unafraid and unashamed and unembarrassed in the presence of God. This is the promise held out to every virtuous man and woman. I, I, I love that. And I have, I mean, I'm in a new office, so I don't always have all my, I haven't all my stuff up yet because it doesn't really match my thick work. <laughs> But it's DNT 12145, and this idea of what then your confidence shall wax strong in the presence of, of, of God, and the priesthood will distill upon my soul as, as, as the Jesus of heaven. Um, this idea, and I, it's probably backwards. <laughs> it no, it isn't. It, well, I, oh, see it. I see it right. <laughs> okay, good. But this idea of let thy bowels be full of charity towards all men all, and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly, it's back to that idea of compassion. It's back to the idea of loving and connecting and serving, that's what gives us confidence. Because yeah. he, we know he'll ask us, did you, did you feed me when I was hungry? Did you give me drink when I was thirsty? Did you clothe me when I was naked? And that can be overwhelming for people sometimes. I know it is for me. You, you can drive around a big city and you can see literal examples of people who need to be clothed and fed and are thirsty because you know people that are out begging on the street. I remember in Romania, we had this man that we would run into regularly on my mission who was out begging. And we every time we'd see him, we'd buy him ice cream because mm -hmm. he was in a wheelchair and being pushed around by his grandson. We, so we'd buy him, him and his grandson ice cream. His name was John or Yon. And um, we, would, we would see him and talk to him. And it's tough because <clears throat> you look at that situation and it's natural to go, why are they in that situation? Why are they, you know, it's easy to judge. Um, and I even had, it's easy, especially if you get to know some of these people, because I remember talking to Yon and he was like, yeah, I have four houses and I'm just making good steady income for my family and supporting all of them because I'm disabled and this is the way I can do this, right? And I think what's beautiful is Christ is saying, it's about finding me in people. If you're, if you see a need, it's just like King Benjamin says, if you have to give, ask God if you're supposed to give it and then give it. If you don't have to give, ask God and he'll say, you don't have, and then say, I don't have any to give. And, you know, we can receive revelation about who we're supposed to help, but we can find Christ in every person we interact with. Right. That was mother we, Teresa. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Not I love beautiful. that. The first time she came across a leper and it was pretty hard to see. Um, and uh, she just imagined and prayed that she might see that she was bathing the savior and what a powerful powerful loving witness so 
Um, I want to bring back this sense of entering into the presence or entering into rest as it is throughout the scriptures, because even the prophet Jacob in the Book of Mormon talks about that he and Nephi labored diligently that they might prepare their people so that they could enter into the rest of the Lord. And he said that the way that he did it or the way that they did it was to teach them about Christ and specifically to teach them about the atonement. And Jacob is one of the few prophets that mentions the cross. He says, we need to view him on the cross in order to enter into rest. Now, what's interesting there for me, I, I love studying about the ancient temple and um, at, in the ancient temple, every single day at three o'clock, there was what was called the hour of prayer. And all of the people uh, in Israel would join together for that prayer. This is what Zacharias was doing when Luke, when the, when the book of Luke opens and Zacharias is burning incense before the veil. It's the hour of prayer. It was a very sacred moment in, um, in the daily life of an Israelite. And people would stop what they were doing. Many people did come into the temple courtyard, the outer courtyard to participate. And it's written that they would either have their hands up raised in prayer or they'd be stretched out with their hands out, out, um, out uh, reaching, uh, stretched out on the ground with their arms stretched out. Joining in this ritual prayer um, of, of the, that the priest would say in front of the veil. And it's a ritual prayer, the same as we have uh, sacrament prayers. Um, so that this prayer that would be said every day in essence, and I'm paraphrasing here, for those who are interested, I can I can put that um, um, I can put that in the notes below. But um, basically, they would the prayer was forgive Israel for our sins, and let us into your presence, and let us behold the countenance of thy face. So yeah. Israel never forgot what happened at Mount Sinai, and most Jews today when they celebrate Pentecost are still anticipating fulfilling that, that invitation. In other words, they recognize, oh, we weren't ready, but we want to be ready next time. And one of the beautiful things is that uh, uh, in some of the sects, uh, the women braid their hair with jewels, like a woman preparing for a bride. So that a lot of the rabbis, again, teach this is going to be the, the wedding when the bridegroom comes and we want to be ready. So in any case, they had this prayer because they never forgot, oh, we didn't get to see his face, but we still have the promise we can. And so how powerful it is that when um, the angel Gabriel comes to Zacharias, first thing he says is, thy prayer has been answered. And that prayer is the ritual prayer. Then there's a comma, and thou shalt have a son. In other words, Zacharias is not praying about a son when he's performing the ritual sacrament prayer, if you will. He is praying the, the prayer that all Israel is expecting him to pray. And he would have normally gone outside on the steps, raised up his hands and given the priestly blessing, which would include may the Lord's face or countenance shine upon you. And, um, and remember, the people are so confused because he can't talk when he comes out. But in any case, Gabriel is saying that is so cool, by the way, I didn't, I had never connected those things. That is so cool. So Gabriel is saying this prayer is answered and this is the way it's going to be fulfilled. We're going to have your son, John, be the preparer of the way you're about to see the Messiah. Now, awesome. Paul extrapolates, and, and Paul is one of the um, best um, uh, doctrinarians on the ancient temple. The book of Hebrews is believed to have been written to the priests and explaining to them what it was the temple ceremonies meant. Now, Paul starts in Hebrews chapter four and repeats many times. He says, the promise of rest, remember, so what does rest mean? Coming into the presence of the Lord was yes. given to them, the Israelites, but not being mixed with faith, they were not able to receive it. And he says, let us fear lest that same promise, we don't come up to it. And then he explains that the role of the high priest in taking the blood and he also goes back to Moses sprinkling the blood on the people. He explains that, that, that he says the blood of bulls, the blood of bulls and goats could never save us. He said, but we have a high priest from the tribe of Judah. And he makes the point, tribe of Judah, therefore not able to officiate in the temple. And he tells us, oh, and it's because he has the Melchizedek priesthood. We have a high priest after the order of the Melchizedek priesthood in Jesus Christ, 
who with his own blood has opened the way, has opened the veil to us. Now he says, let's go forward with boldness through a new and living way, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And so again, this promise coming down through the ages of come into the presence of God, really know God for yourself. Every time Christ does appear to any people, he always invites them to touch him and to have that personal witness and that personal knowledge. And Paul is saying, we should have confidence in going forward and seeking for this same blessing. And I also love that Paul is teaching us it's available through the Melchizedek priesthood. What wonderful connections you've just made in my brain. <laughs> that is so cool. That is so cool. And it's so fulfilling too, because I think in some ways there's been, a, there, and maybe we don't, in ways we don't fully understand, there's been a crutch throughout history where people have been drawn to the idea. That's why they built the golden calf. They've been drawn to this idea that there's something physical that has to save us. Mm -hmm. the staff um or uh you know looking at the the even the serpent on, on the staff or the worshiping an idol or these different physical things that yeah. really if we're not careful they, that's what becomes the dust of babylon right yeah. and christ is instead saying no it's me come know me come see me come be with me come back and uh, he prepares a way and i i oftentimes envision this idea of lifting the veil like how a bride lifts her veil when she's married the symbolism there it can be very powerful that, oh, we, we finally see. Can I say I wrote a book on that called The Redemption of the Bride? You did. You it did. Is, and I couldn't remember what it was called. And I love that. It has, it that. has that, all yeah. of this in there. I want to share, because I, I know we, we need to close fairly soon, but I want to share a prophecy of Jeremiah um, mm -hmm. that kind of encapsulates everything we're talking about here. And, it, and he right. says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniqui iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. In my mind, this is just what you were saying, Sam. Mm. In, in that moment when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, right? This, this well, realization is Remember. And I like to think that if he's writing it in our inward parts, um, I always like to think of a good hug. You know, I, I think, <laughs> yeah. well, I think that he, you know, he wants a relationship with us. He wants a close, yeah. I mean, he wants an intimate relationship with us, a very close relationship. And I just figure if I ever were to either touch his wounds or I were to have that hug, it's written in my inward parts. But the truth is, and I think that you've alluded to this, Sam, is that we have many opportunities to have his covenant and the spirit and witness of who he is written in our hearts on a daily basis, through our prayers, through our service, through our truly seeking him and seeking to have his light in our lives. And um, in our, I love the, the um, again, back to section 93, if our I be single, our whole bodies will be filled with his light. That's, that's the true definition of being in our inner, inward parts, right? This idea of being quickened by that celestial level of love and light. And then back to the restoration where we began, you know, I, I began this search because I wanted to believe that somebody, that God was talking to somebody today and I wanted to follow him and I wanted to know him and I wanted to know there was revelation. And we have that entire uh, fullness in the restoration. And by the way, President Nelson says the restoration is still ongoing. So I yeah. have to wonder how much more is coming because there is so much and so many blessings for us to ponder. So I just wanted to close with this from Doctrine and Covenants 88, since we both love this so much. Um, this is the Lord's promise to all of us. He says, therefore, sanctify yourselves, 
that your minds become single to God and the days will come that you shall see him for he will unveil his face unto you and it shall be in his own time and in his own way and according to his own will. Amen. 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 <laughs> Makes you want to shout hallelujah, right? <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. We just got to wait for it. And we just got to prepare ourselves to see him because he'll be familiar to us and we'll rejoice in it. Yeah. We live Thank in you a so much. Home. This has been such a great discussion. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful for you, Sam, and for the spirit that you bring. I really enjoy doing this together. Thank um, you. I just want to testify that we do live in that glorious day that Jeremiah and so many others prophesied of when there is the fullness and that all of us are still invited as fast as we're able, as much as we're ready. And for those who don't feel ready, please, let's take that lesson from the Israelites, because the Lord in his mercy provided several different tools to help them so they could be ready. And so wherever we are on that path, let's remember that the Lord is the shepherd the good shepherd, and that he is doing all that he can to send angels to us. Um, he is sending, whether that is in the next door neighbor or uh, our parents or our kids or the person down the street, um, he is sending angels to us. He is sending prophets to us to help us to, to find that path. And most particularly, the blessings that we have of the temple. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And um, for those who are watching, please be sure to um, like and share and subscribe and leave your comments below. We really appreciate you. Thank you.